here center and she done her Martin of Talmo in Octago University from New Zealand and uh, she did fellowship in uh, retina and uveitis from the uh, uh, Tilunga Institute of Ophthalmology. Ma'am, I would like to welcome you on our uh, platform, ma'am. Okay, good afternoon to you, everyone, and Namaste. It's my pleasure to be here with you. Sunin, sir, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay. We can proceed. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and Namaste. It's my pleasure to be here with you uh, this afternoon uh, with my little talk, and it's mainly on using uses of diagnostic imaging modalities in diagnosing retinal disorders. Uh, so, uh, as the, Mr. Kapil has already uh, done my introduction, I'm currently working at the University of Halanki. Uh, I do not have any financial disclosures to make uh, in this presentation. Mm, I am not able to. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, ma'am, we can uh, hear you. Yes, ma'am. I am not yes, able to. Is there any problem? Yeah, the slide is not. Uh, how do I do it? Um, moving, ma'am? Yeah, is that I'm moving, ma'am? Yeah, I'm not able to. Yeah, I'm okay, not able so to. Uh, you... It's not changing. Yes, yes, ma'am, it's not changing. So, can you please press your skip button on your laptop, ma'am? Skip uh, button. On the top? Skip? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, now it's going yeah, to be done. Okay, so just a minute, ma'am. Okay, uh, can you please press once again, ma'am? Skip. Yeah. Or you can. Um, or you can. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, okay. Is it working, ma'am? Yeah, it's working. Um, I'll let's see. Okay, now okay, yeah. this will be good. Okay. Um, I don't know why it's not uh, switching. Okay. okay. Is it okay if I just do the do it on this mode? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's okay, ma'am. Fine. I think I'll do uh, do on this one. Sorry about that. So when we talk about um, so when we talk about the um, types of imaging that we use in uh, retinal disorders. There are two types, invasive and non-invasive. The invasive ones, uh, as we know, are fundus blurs and angiogram and the ICG. In these two, we use different types of dyes to um, dyes, and then the, the, those dyes will go into the retinal blood vessels, and, and the photos are captured in different time, uh, time um, to get the uh, picture of what's going on in the retinal vasculature. So these two are invasive, means that we need to inject the dye and the patient has to go through the circulation of the dye. And in doing that, there might be some complications. So that's the reason why we do not, um, these days, we do not prefer, prefer to use invasive procedures in, uh, to diagnose retinal disorders. So there has been a paradigm shift uh, these days in using um, towards using non-invasive <laughs> diagnostic procedures, uh, which are the fundus, fundus photograph, on the fundus autofluorescence and uh, mainly OCT. So OCT has been um, uh, OCT has been uh, very uh, very much in use these days, and it has caused uh, uh, like a revolution in um, diagnosing retinal disorders. These are non-invasive uh, techniques where we do not need to do any um, intervention to the patient, and there is very very less uh, chances of complications in these patients. So to start with, uh, when we talk about uh, OCT, it is, uh, as we all know, it's optical coherence uh, tomography. It is an imaging technique that uses low coherence light to give us the micrometer, micrometer resolution of retinal structures in two dimension or three dimension from uh, within the retinal tissues. So this technique is based on low coherence interferometry principle and typically employs the near infrared light, which causes more depth of penetration, which gives us more 
a high resolution um, image, cross sectional image of the retina. It also renders, an, uh, so it, uh, with these principles, it is able to render an in vivo cross sectional view of the retina that is accurate to with, within at least 10 to 15 microns from its actual normal uh, uh, dimensions. Okay, so these are the two photographs I've got here um, on uh, OCT. So this one is the this is um, serious OCT, which which was a uh, uh, which was quite popular uh, about uh, five to seven years before, and this was a picture from one of those machines where we can see different uh, uh, different layers of the retina segmentation of the retina, which has been color coded, and these en enables us to uh, identify what's happening at different layers of the retina. And this one is the Spectralis uh, OCT, where it's, which is a second generation OCT, uh, where there are the segmentation of the retinal layers, which are very much, um, very much precise and clearer than in the previous uh, previous kind of OCT. So this is just the this is just to show you how the segmentation of the layers of the retina looks like. So this we call as a reflectivity pattern of the normal eye. So these are normal retina of normal individual without any pathological uh, conditions. So when we talk about OCT, we need to know how the OCT, a use of OCT came into in uh, inception and then how it has grown over the years. So I've got this little OCT slide on OCT timeline. So from its, uh, when the OCT came into use in uh, around 1991, the OCT at that time was time domain OCT. Uh, the machine we used were um, Stratus and it was uh, the acquisition speed of uh, approximately 400 A scans per second. Yeah, and there, was, uh, there were radial slices which were oriented 30 degrees apart. And there were six radial size slices which were taken and then we, the images were averaged uh, out to give us the cross-sectional image of the retina. So as we can see, there were only 400 A scans that was uh, averaged out and only six radial slices. There were chances of uh, uh, missing the pathologies in between those slices and the resolution was also not that great. So, uh, so um, uh, they were working on improving this uh, uh, improving these um, limitations on the OCT, and they came up with the spectral domain OCT around 2007. It came into use, uh, and uh, there was much more increase in acquisition speed of, uh, from uh, 400 A scans and the previous um, OCTs to 20,000 to 40,000 A scans per second. So as we can see, there was a, a very much increase in the uh, scans that they were taken. And the wavelength that was used in the spectral domain OCT was a bit uh, longer wavelength, 800 to 870 nanometer, so which provided much better penetration. And um, so eventually it was able to give us the enhanced resolution um, scan of the retina. There was decreased motion artifacts, which was uh, present in previous um, primitive OCT scans. And there were less chances of missing lesions because the slices were so much uh, more than in the previous scans. And, and then came the swept source OCT, which has only been uh, which has only been into use since past uh, five years or so. Uh, the number of scans in, uh, that uh, it does in a second is in, in one second is much more increased. So it has increased from twenty to forty thousand to. Uh, one lakh to four lakh scans per second, which is quite more, and obviously giving much, much better resolution of the um, uh, segmentation of the retina and much longer wavelength are used in the source OCT, 1050 to 1060 nanometers, giving much more uh, deeper penetration and uh, more visibility of the choroid and sclera as well. So as we know that we've uh, moved on from OCT to OCT, angiography these days, both the spectral domain and the swept source OCT are used to generate OCT angiography images. Now, just to give you an idea of how the OCT has evolved over, over the years, this is the first, uh, first primitive kind of OCT which was uh, built, and these are the segmentation that was visible of the retina. As you can see, there are segmentation vis visible, 
but they are not very clear, not very sharp, and there were more chances of uh, uh, more chances of uh, missing missing the very fine details of the retina. And also, also the motion artifacts was also very uh, more in on those OCTs. As you can see, the uh, the lines segmentation very uh, nice and sharp. So this is time domain OCT, the initial ones. And this is the spectral domain OCT, which has been, uh, this is on the color form, uh, uh, but we usually use uh, only the black and white thing, black and white uh, um, up, uh, photo to basically um, diagnose retinal conditions. Here, as you can see, the lines are very crisp and sharp. You can see many more lines in, on the outer retinal layers, which is very important to diagnose various retinal conditions. Inner layers of the retina also segmented very precisely and uh, obviously much more easier to gain disease identification. Now, this one here is the swept source OCT. Swept source OCT, where um, uh, where it is much more um, much more detail is vis visible there. Uh, the outer retinal layers as well as the inner retinal layers are segmented, segmented very precisely. And one more thing that you can, you can notice on swept source OCT is the is the um, choroidal layer, how uh, distinct it is from the than that of the previous OCTs, and you can identify uh, many choroidal disorders while using this OCT as well. So I have to mention that uh, in between, in sort of in between um, the spectral domain OCT and the swept source OCT, there was a a technique we used we used to use called enhanced depth imaging to uh, uh, to um, measure the choroidal thickness in various choroidal disorders. Uh, that was a technique we used on the spectral domain OCT. But on swept sources, there is an option where we can just go and measure the um, choroidal thickness, and it is very helpful in many uh, choroidal and retinal pathologies. Okay, and then. Now, uh, all the inventions and all the um, advances that are happening on the on uh, these diagnostic uh, tools, there are but there are some limitations of OCTs as well. Uh, it uses light waves, and so unlike sound waves uh, using ultrasound, um, so because it uses light waves, the, the media media has to be very clear to get the to get uh, more um, clear images. Um, so, in cases where their media might not be clear uh, because of the cataract or vitreous hemorrhage or any other vitreous uh, opacities, uh, we are not able to uh, get a very good scan of the retina. Although the the companies claim uh, claim that you know you can you can get a very uh, good quality images even in the presence of vitreous hemorrhages or media opacities. But in practical, it, it is not. Uh, it doesn't seem to, um, you know, work like that. When there are media obesity, there is bound to uh, bound to be those uh, artifacts, and then uh, it's it's kind of difficult to get into the detail of the retina. So that's the one of the limitations. Uh, and uh, so since the, these machines are very costly, the the uh, the more advanced form of uh, machines we have, the, the cost increases. So it is uh, not affordable in low resource settings, which is a major, major, major setback um, in those places where uh, where we are actually needed in remote areas. It means OCT scans are very much needed in diabetic patients or elderly people who might be having uh, retinal disorders and not getting diagnosed. But because of the cost, we are not able to take these machines to those places. Uh, for some reason, the procedure has disappeared from here. Sorry about that. So let's talk a little bit about the procedure of the OCT. It is very simple. It is uh, very, um, it is very um, easy to teach, e easy to learn, and then easy to you know practice every day. We are able to do the OCT and run the clinic side by side because of the very, uh, uh, very. Um, uh, because it's very easy to operate. So the procedure is not that much really. You just need to sit, sit uh, a few uh, few times 
with someone who knows about the procedure and you can learn it. So it's it's basically about um, it's basically about uh, um, whether the machine is mediatric or non-mediatric. If it is mediatric, the earlier machines were uh, mediatric type and they need the people to people to be dilated, but the newer ones. Uh, um, do not need uh, people to be dilated, so it's just easier. But they see that the people should be at least three millimeter um, in um, diameter to get good quality of scan. And uh, you should know how to position the patient and how to uh, get the scan on the monitor. Depending on different machines, there are different ways to do it. Some are um, some are touch screen uh, kind. Some are you need to operate with the mouse. So you just need to go in and out, uh, go in and out uh, um, of the retina and find a, find a place where you get the sharp, uh, the sharp uh, segmentation of the retina and that's where you capture it. And uh, things to, that you need to remember when doing the OCT is that um, if you're not getting good quality scans, then you should, uh, uh, you should try to see why you're not getting good scans. There could be some media opacities which might not be letting you to get into the depth as uh, much as you would like. Or there could be some, when you try uh, various, uh, try try several times, then the cornea might go dry, and then the image uh, will just get worse. So you have to address those issues as well. And uh, in patient's part, the patient's eyes might be mo moving, and all those things you need to, uh, you need a very good counseling before starting the, uh, procedure so that the patients know where they where to look and uh, and um, and how to keep their eyes stable. And you should also be very much uh, um, you should be you should be you should know the, uh, the different kinds of um, software that are built into the machine so that you know how to uh, how to properly save them and uh, um, keep them for later use as well. Um, so when you do the OCD, this is the kind of um, kind of um, results that you get. Um, so this this one is just the thickness map, where um, where the thickness is uh, given here in another picture in the numbers on the ETDRS uh, 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 division of the retina. So the red is means always it's um, it's uh, swollen, it's angry, and it's pathological. The green and uh, yellow. Others are more or less of the normal retina. If they, you see somewhere blue, then that's thinning of the retina. So this is just a color coding color map. And uh, you see the cross section. This is how you uh, get the uh, retina in, uh, in uh, this, is, uh, this is one of the condition, one of the uh, patients who has got uh, uh, diabetic macular edema, seems like. So there are lots of cystic spaces in, in the, um, uh, uh, retinal layers, some subretinal fluid, the retinal pigment epithelium seems intact. So these are the various stages of the diabetic retinopathy, uh, diabetic macular edema. The same thing you can see in the color at different um, uh, different levels. So that's what we see, and these are the layers that you can uh, you can see and see if there, to what extent, to what depth the, there has been uh, pathological changes on the retina. So there are many uses of OCT. OCT is not only used in eye, actually. It is used in cardiovascular diseases and other diseases of the uh, body as well. In eyes, it has got major use in its eye because of the um, because the, we have got this clear media. We can pass the lights to the pupil and then get, very, uh, get um, up to the retina and segment the retina in vivo. Uh, it is not that easy when we want to use OCT in other conditions like cardiovascular disease and all that because nowhere else in the body we have that clear medium to pass the light through. So uses of OCT in macular, there are many macular conditions where we use OCT um, like macular hole, macular popular, or irritable membrane, the different visual macular traction, visual macular uh, conditions, macular edema and exodus, which could be due to diabetes, which could be due to any other vascular causes, detachment of the neurosensory retina, and uh, detachment of the retinal pigment epithelium. And these are the different layers of uh, retinal detachment, retinal schesis, pachycoroid is the, it's a disease spectrum where there is thick choroid. 
So with these newer OCGs, we are able to measure the border thickness and uh, and uh, diagnose the conditions. There are various choroidal tumors which could be which can be diagnosed by OCT. Okay, so in the procedure, procedure I've discussed a little bit uh, about OCT artifacts. We always need to keep in mind that there could be artifacts there. That's the reason we might not be getting good quality scans. So the patient-related artifacts, as I mentioned before, are eye movements. Uh, some people are just not uh, able to uh, focus and look at the uh, target light. And in some people, they could be uh, media opacities. And you're not getting um, you're getting too much movement in people with macular degeneration or some macular disorders um, the patient is not able to uh, look at the center they have eccentric viewing and that's how you're not able to get that macular cube um, so you have to um, sort of quickly go through a patient's uh, notes as well before doing the OCT. It's always helpful to so that you can prepare yourself as to how to get good quality scan. And there could be some operator related uh, artifacts as well. Um, sometimes, uh, when you're, especially when you're doing uh, learning the uh, OCT scans, then you, you might not be very, very much comfortable operating the machine. There could be poor focusing, and the scans might not be centered, and you're just not getting good quality scans. In those cases, it's always helpful to have someone by your side and then um, uh, learn as you do it instead of trying, trying, and then not giving a good quality report uh, to the uh, doctor or the patient, it's always best to, um, to learn until you're comfortable using the machine. Now, there could be some software-related uh, artifacts as well. If the segmentation algorithm in that machine is, uh, for some reason, not working, it's not uh, uh, calibrated properly, then you're bound to get uh, um, bound to get uh, not good quality with CT, and you have to look at that as well. Okay, so so now let's just um, have a have a look at some of the OCTs that we can get in common retinal disorders. Uh, it's always good to um, uh, sort of get an idea while you are doing OCT as to what's happening in the patient's eyes. So. Uh, so you know more about the conditions and you're able to counsel the patient better. So this first row, first column of images are all, um, these are vitro, vitro macular interface disorder, that's what we call it. So where the vitreous, uh, posterior vitreous um, face is uh, detaching from the um, retina, center of the macula, then it tends to sort of pull the, pull the, um, uh, pull the retina at the center of the macula and causes distortion, a distortion of the retinal um, structures as well as distortion of images to the patient. So they, they, these are different stages of uh, vitro, macular, uh, vitro macular traction. This is the first one, is the initial phase where there's just, it's detaching, but it's just uh, uh, not fully detached. So this one, on the second one, it's a uh, the stage, it's a, bit more progressed, progressed stage of vitromacular traction, where it's uh, causing traction on the retina, giving rise to this intra-retinal cyst, and further traction causing more distortion of the retinal layers, and uh, more symptomatic to the patients. And this is the fourth stage where there is uh, very much uh, traction into the, uh, of the retinal layers, uh, and this is very symptomatic, and this might need surgical correction. And on this side, you have stages of macular hole, which we, you can detect by using OCT very easily. So, <clears throat> patient might be complaining of uh, central distortion of vision or central black patch of vision and things like that. You do an OCT and find that there is a defect on the center of the <clears throat> macula, over region. The, the segmentation is just, uh, there's a defect. So depending on what size of macular hole, uh, you can you be sort of um, classify them classify them into partial thickness or full thickness. Here you can see a small macular hole. Uh, the size is less than so 250 to 400 micron of uh, a defect is uh, is the early stage, and that's uh, that's what better prognosis. Uh, if if the size of the defect grows are increasing. 
to more than 400 micron, and there's sub subretinal fluid uh, deposition there as well. Uh, this is a sign of poor prognosis. And this fourth one is the myopic eye, which has got like a full thickness macular hole. There's still vitrovectal attraction happening there, and subretinal fluid there. So this is for very bad prognosis unless intervened on time. Now, so with the, with the increased number of elderly, elderly population in our country as well as worldwide, we get a lot of patients who have got uh, uh, macular degeneration of different stages. Um, so they are dry and wet macular degeneration, dry macular degenerations. Well, um, I'm sorry, I don't have uh, any pictures of dry macular degeneration, but they have got this regular, something like this, irregular um, drusenoid deposit, deposits along the outer layers of the retinas, there will be like little mounds of deposition there, which are actually drusen. That's what you can see in dry macular degeneration, somewhat like this. This, this is kind of dry macular degeneration going into wet, where there is uh, some, uh, you know, this um, subretinal deposits, uh, subretinal collection of fluid happening there. So different stages of macular degeneration. As you can see on this one, this is a like progressed uh, kind of macular de degeneration where there's interretinal cyst, the, the macular fluvial contour is all distorted. You, do, you, you can't really see the, you know, the nice and uh, pitted uh, fluvial pit there. And there are uh, deposition of uh, uh, fiber, vascular, sorry, the fluid and then uh, the um, exudates and all that are deposited there. And there's this dark area. This is the subretinal fluid. This, these are the biomarkers, the hallmarks of wet macular degeneration. And they, this is how we decide whether or not to treat, this, uh, treat these conditions. And uh, this one here, the third one, is another stage of macular degeneration. But there's, you can see more of a homogeneous uh, collection rather than the fluid. Uh, kind of collection here. So that looks like a fibrovascular BED. There's a pigment epithelial detachment and fib fibrovascular collection there. That's another type of wet AMD. So that's uh, these are all the choroidal neovascular membranes, which we can detect very easily in OCT. So in back in previous days, when when we didn't have OCT, we had to rely on uh, rely on the um, fluorescent angiography, the invasive procedure to, to diagnose uh, wet macular degeneration and then to decide whether or not to um, uh, start any treatment. And after starting treatment, again, you had to do fluorescent angiography to see whether or not the treatment was responding. So it was kind of very much invasive thing that happened back in those days, but not anymore. Uh, we just do OCT. We would like to do OCT on every visit, but because of the cost and um, sometimes if we can just, you know, uh, just um, uh, uh, examine clinically and know whether there is this fluid or not, we don't do OCT on every visit, uh, but every now and then we do an OCT to see how the uh, disease, how, how the condition is going and whether or not it's responding to treatment. So that's, those are the OCTs of the wet AMD. Now, um, so this is, uh, these are the pictures where you can see um, there, there's increased thickness of the, increased thickness of the um, retina, overall thickness is increased. There are cystic-like uh, species uh, uh, with fluid in it, uh, intraretinal. There's, uh, if you look down here, it's a subretinal uh, collection of fluid. And uh, this has gone uh, even more on this one. Uh, but all the same features. And on this one, there's increase in the subretinal sub fluid, and there are some drusen-like uh, uh, drusen -like elevation on the outer layers of the retina, of the um, elevation underneath the RPE. So these two are, uh, this, so this one is, uh, uh, by, the, by the looks of it, it's macular edema, which could be due to uh, diabetes, it could be diabetic macular edema, or could be due to um, any kind of vein occlusion involving the macula. Okay, so in retinal branch retinal vein occlusion, um, central retinal vein occlusion, or diabetic macula edema, uh, these kind of pictures are very common on OCT. 
And on this one, there is in addition to uh, in addition to the intravenous changes, the fluid and all, uh, which could be due to diabetes or um, vein occlusion, there are significant uh, a significant collection of some retinal fluid as well with some changes in the RPE. So it could be so there could be um, the diabetic or vein occlusion thing in addition to the macular degeneration changes happening in this eye. And uh, pigment epithelial detachment uh, are also very, very, uh, pigment epithelial detachment are also very, um, very easy to detect on, um, sorry, easy to detect on OCT. So here you can see a big pigment epithelial. So this is the RPE, which is detached from the Brooks membrane, and there's collection going on underneath the RPE. So that's one kind here. That, that it, on, on this, it looks like hemorrhagic PED because you can see the homogeneous sort of material there. It's not very clear, like clear fluid. While on this one, it looks like a very clear fluid, so serous uh, PED. And uh, this one, again, has some homogeneous uh, material there. And this one here, if you look carefully, this is a PED, detachment of the pigment uh, epithelium. And, uh, you can see this little round thing, which is a vacuole-like thing, which is a, a cross-section of the polyp. Um, there's a term called polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy, which is also a type of macular degeneration. And it's not this, uh, um, these are you know, simple PEDs, but this one is PED secondary to the polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy. So the treatment is entirely different. And with OCT, when you, this is a, one of the source OCT, so you can even see the polyp and cross section. And so it, it makes us much easier to know what's causing this PED and, uh, and how to uh, treat it. And even with treatment, we can monitor it, monitor it by doing serial OCT scans and see uh, if um, the, this is actually improving or not. Now, so this is another OCT. This is actually um, the OCT of my case, which I have published published in Retina in 2014. Uh, so this is a young female. Um, uh, I think she was 40, Caucasian female, uh, who has got this uh, um, subretinal collection of fluid here in the in one eye, in the right eye, and with treatment. Uh, with treat, so we did the scan. It looks like this. And we treat it with the vaccine injections, and this is a um, scan after treatment. So with OCT, it's very easy for us to actually know whether the treatment is working or not, um, because if we only do clinical examination, sometimes we're not sure whether the treatment is working, so the patient might be getting injections without getting any benefit out of that, which is not good uh, in part of the patient. So this is how we can monitor um, also the patient to, who are getting treatment and whether or not they're improving. So this lady had this uh, uh, so, so choroidal neovascularization related subretinal fluid, which we treated. And on the other eye, there, there is, if you see here, just underneath the so, retinal um, RPE, there's a mound of homogeneous material there. It looks kind of compact. It's not, uh, it's not fluid-like. It's not like fibrovascular. It's more like, it looks like a dense material there. This is actually adult vitelliform macular, de macular degeneration, which happens in uh, 40, 50 age group of people. And there's collection of fluid, collection of the uh, dense uh, vitelliform material there. So that's also very clearly visible on OCT. And uh, over time, this vitelliform material um, sort of scrambled into um, different pieces, giving an uh, appearance like this. So these are different kinds of uh, you know, materials that could deposit uh, underneath the retina in uh, different disorders. So best disease is uh, the, is the um, kind of, it's a vitelliform, um, uh, it's a vitelliform uh, material in the best disease as well, but ha that happens in the, like younger patients and this adult vitelliform macular degeneration in older, older patients, okay? So with OCTs, we can have a look at those uh, disorders. And so now, uh, now there's a, because we don't, uh, we're not using uh, those invasive uh, 
fluorescent angiogram and uh, ICG as much. ICG is not even available in Nepal, so we're just not able to have a look at the choroidal vasculature. Uh, so we have to depend on OCT. Uh, and these new OCTs give us a much better picture uh, into the choroid. But, but to look at the, sometimes we need, we really need to look at the choroid, I mean the retinal vasculatures to know what's happening at the level of the blood vessels. So the OCT angiography is the newest, uh, latest technique that has uh, enabled us to uh, actually have a look at the uh, retinal um, uh, capillaries um, at different uh, at different layers, and then you can you are also able to get a uh, cross section of the retina as well. So this is an OCT angiography of one of my patients who has got macular degeneration. So this is the um, brief uh, sort of picture report that you get with OCT and geography. Um, the quality is not that great because the patient had a bit of cataract. Uh, so this one is here, it uh, shows us the superficial uh, capillary layers, uh, capillary layer, and this is the deep capillary layer. This is the layer, layer at the level of the RPE, and then this is uh, at the underneath the RPE. So this is how you, they segment the retina into four layers and you can get a picture of what's happening where. So the superficial and deep capillary layer uh, seems uh, pretty much normal to me. It's a little bit uh, sparse, but it's not majorly affected. However, these two layers, the RPE layer and then the layer of the photoreceptors, there's invasion into that layer, into the photoreceptor layer by the choroidal neovascular membrane. So that's what happens in wet macular degeneration. And that's very clearly visible. And uh, when we slice the retina at that level, that this is what we get. And uh, this is what is seen on wet macular degeneration at the level where there is leakage of the choroidal neovascular membrane. You see this uh, subretinal fluid. There's some sort of fibrovascular deposition underneath the RPE. So there's a mixed kind of macular degeneration going on like type one and type two. Uh, that's the, just to, to give you an idea of what the OCT and GKF look like and how it is. It gives us much more, uh, much more additional details than just the OCT. Um, so I think that's about all. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you everyone for your time. If there are any questions. Okay, uh, thank you so much, ma'am. That's such a wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you. We are heading towards the uh, question, ma'am, on uh, chat box. Let's see how many questions that have raised. So there is a question from the Ananda Boreal. He is asking for: Is there any? Is there? Uh, is there any? Uh, is there any uh, consideration in the patient like nystagmus? Large angle uh, squint uh, while examining the OCT. Yeah, so I don't think in any of the machines that we use today have got the uh, you know sort of a self uh, self correction self uh, I mean um, uh, thing for nystagmus or um, the the squint thing. We just have to we just need to. Uh, look at the patient's eye before actually starting the OCT and then see if we can manage it. Uh, because the, these newer OCTs are, they are very good at picking up, uh, picking up the scan, even if the patient has like one short, one very quick glance on the, on the target, you can just uh, get that, uh, you know, get that piece of uh, segment of the scan and you can um, sort of look in the monitor and see uh, if you can just get a foveal control, then that should be that should uh, work for us. Like we don't need to get the whole cube, and we don't need to wait for uh, lines to scan across the whole cube. Uh, if you can just get a quick glance, they would, they would get, just capture it, or we can um, have a look at the monitor itself. Uh, that's the best we can do uh, because with the nystagmus, we know that uh, the more we try patients, we try the patients to get to look at the target, the more they uh, sort of um, uh, move. Uh, and it's it's hard to do in the stangles, but with this with the squint, we can always use the the target, the external target that uh, uh, we have on the machines to um, to get the to get the macula on the center of the cube. 
and then do the scan. I think we, we should use uh, external targets rather than trying with the internal targets and we can, can get in nowhere. Okay, so there is another question. Uh -huh. uh, the question, ma'am. Okay, so there is a one question from the top con. Is there any method in the OCD to find out any subclinical from the macro degeneration? Yes, uh, it, it is actually very good at picking up uh, subclinical macular degeneration because these days, when uh, what we can't see clinically. Uh, what we can't clinically, we can detect uh, it on OCD. So these days we focus, um, uh, we focus on the, that ellipsoid region of the OCD, where which is basically the interdigitation zone, zone and the uh, inter. Uh, okay, Mr. Ramesh, excuse me, ma'am. Excuse me, ma'am. Am I audible to you, ma'am? Uh, hello, Dr. Sumitra, ma'am. Am I audible to you, ma'am? Am I audible to you, ma'am? Am I audible to you, ma'am? Okay. Just wait for a few minutes. Ma'am, you are not audible to us. Uh, hello, ma'am. You are not audible to us, ma'am. Okay, I guess uh, you have. It will be better if okay, you can know, you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can, ma'am. But we can hear oh, any I answer, any of the answers. Yes, ma'am. We can hear, we can't can hear, hear any now? answer. Yes, yes, we can hear you, ma'am. Am I audible to you? Oh, uh, yeah, but I don't know. It's coming very, uh, it's very uh, low volume. Okay, ma'am. Also, ma'am, uh, I guess there is uh, another uh, system working on your phone. Can you please uh, uh, log in or log out from your phone and connect with your laptop? The audio, we can connect with the, uh, your laptop. It would be a more. So shall I uh, disconnect my phone? Uh, yes, yes, ma'am. It will be better if you disconnect from your phone and go in from your laptop. Okay. Can you please uh, unmute yourself in your laptop? There is a mic button. If you yes, yes ma'am, it's working now. I guess. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, ma'am, we can. But uh, can you please repeat the uh, answer that was I asked before? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, ma'am. We can hear you. Yes, ma'am. It is audible. Okay, so, uh, ma'am, can you please increase your volume, ma'am? Okay, let me check it. I, I'll call the doctor. This conference will now be recorded. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, it is audible. I can hear you. You forget to hear yeah. your volume. Yes, you're, 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 you're so that's what okay, you can do. Ma'am, you your volume. We uh, mute before it. We make a volume zero before starting the uh, presentation, and you forget to use the volume. Now it's good, ma'am. We are clear okay. to you. Our and clear to you. Okay, that's yeah. great. So can you please repeat the once again top one question, ma'am? Is there any method in OCT to find out uh, any soft clinical uh, from the macular degeneration? Yeah. So with the so with the subclinical macular degeneration, it's basically where we can't see it clinically, but then we can uh, we can sometimes detect changes that's happening at the at the um, you know the micro structural level and uh, see if there if it's going to um, progress into macular degeneration. So we focus on the ellipsoid area of the macula, which is basically the uh, those four lines, the outer four lines of the retina, into uh, uh, and uh, photoreceptor interdigitation, intersegment, in, inner segment, outer, in, segment, outer segment. If that area is kind of distorted, it's not very uh, nice and sharp, 
some distortion, some defect there, then we know that there's some subclinical uh, macular degeneration going on there. And if we um, if we follow this patient with serial OCT scans, they will eventually develop some subretinal fluid and then develop crack macular degeneration. So there is a so we we focus on that area to find out if there is any subclinical changes going on. And these newer kind of OCTs are very helpful in giving us that idea. Okay. okay. Oh, yes, ma'am. Now uh, there is another question from the Sonia M. Uh, she is asking for, could you briefly discuss about the autofluorescence, ma'am? Oh, yes. I was supposed to mention something about the autofluorescence, but I forgot. Yeah, so autofluorescence these days is very helpful. It is non-invasive and it, it gives us more idea than uh, more idea than just the fundus um, photograph or infrared picture of the retina, where the, the fluorophores, the, those uh, without an injection of any dye, if there are any, some fluorescing material on the at the level of the retinal pigment epithelium or even, uh, or even um, um, above that, then those uh, substances fluoresces and they give us the autofluorescence without injection of the dye. So these, this technique has been very helpful in diagnosing cases like where there is a you know different kind of drusen at which level the drusens are we can detect the autofluorescence in various choroidal uh, choroidal diseases like uh, choroid um, choroiditis and all that we can we can uh, delineate the um, outline of the choroidal lesions and see if they autofluoresce or not on autofluorescence and that's how we can know the activity of the disease and in inherited retinal diseases, we can make use of autofluorescence by seeing whether the, those are in star guards, which mainly in star guards disease, if there is collection of this liposuction containing material in the uh, liposuction in the center of the macula, and if it's autofluorescence, then we know that this this uh, condition might be progressing. And if the out, outline of the area is not autofluorescing, then uh, we know we kind of get an idea that it might not be very much progressing. So that's how we can make use of autofluorescence um, uh, uh, in uh, today's practice. It's it's very helpful actually. Okay, ma'am. So there is another question from the Ananta. He is asking for what are the factors that, uh, what are the factors determining OCT resolution? Factors determining OCT resolution. The first thing is the the kind of um, uh, the kind of uh, you know the uh, the technology that's used in the machine, uh, and the main thing is the. Uh, uh, media, media uh, opacity, media like uh, how clear the media is. If there is any uh, opacity, if there is any, um, the, if there is any interruption in the, you know, the pathway of the the rays that they use, uh, then you can, you tend to get uh, less resolution image images. And sometimes the, the motion artifact as well in, in part of the patient where they move eyes a lot. And sometimes you're not able to focus in and out of the retina and get to that you know, very uh, clear, clear picture of the retina. And then you also get uh, uh, less resolution images. Uh, uh, I think those are mainly because of the artifacts and the media opacity. Okay. I guess he uh, got his answer. And there is another question uh, from the top con how to differentiate the occult and uh, five uh, fibrovascular PED in OCT. Okay, so uh, fibrovascular PED and occult um, PED um, that those are basically depends on whether it's the type one and type two or uh, AMD. Where where is the where is the collection of the uh, where is the collection of the, um, the fluid or the fibrovascular um, deposition there? Uh, fibrovascular PED, uh, was it talking about PED or AM? Uh, sorry, ma'am? Uh, was it talking about PED or? Yes, ma'am, PED, yes, ma'am. PED, yeah. So, if there is serious PED, uh, then uh, you, you tend to get a very dark, uh, uh, very dark, uh, and uh, you know, it's a, without any disturbance, collection of fluid underneath the uh, RPE. 
But if there is fibrovascular PED, then there tends to be uh, not so not a clear like clear dark area. There there will be some homogeneous material there. Some uh, uh, some um, uh, what do you call it the uh, um, white white material white um, white areas dark areas not very homogeneous. So that's how we um, we know those are fibrovascular PEDs and not just the plain serous uh, serous fluid. Okay, so. No, there is another question from the Sushma Chaudhary. Thank you so much for your question. She is asking for what is the mm -hmm. key points for the OCT angiography? Is uh, is it useful for all the cases like uh, corridorly vascular region or any other macular degeneration? Uh, what was the first part? What is the what was it? The first part. Now, what is the key points uh, for OCT angiography, ma'am? Mm -hmm. So I think what she means to say is uh, uh, what is the additional uh, benefits in OCT angiography. Um, so yes, there, there, it is very useful to detect. Uh, it, it is very useful in the, uh, in the diagnosing and monitoring the cases of um, uh, macular degeneration, especially the wet corridorly uh, vascular membranes, uh, because on OCT we can only see the segmentation of the retina where the fluid is how. How uh, progressed the fluid is, and how the, how much the fluid has receded after getting treatment. Whereas on OCT angiography, it is it is actually um, we are able to see uh, at different slices of the retina whether the the corridor neovascular membrane is just underneath the RPE layer or has it gone into the retina, and there are intraretinal fluid spaces as well. And uh, you can actually see those neovascular fronts coming from the underneath the RPE and going into the into the retinal layers. And uh, with treatment, when we treat them with injections, those uh, neovascular fronts seem to, seem to shrink and they, they, they seem to sort of uh, form into a fibrotic structure. And that's how we know that they, the treatment has really worked. So there is, uh, um, there is um, much more additional benefits in OCT angiography compared to just OCT. Um, so I think those are the key points where you can actually see the what's happening with the blood vessels, whether those blood vessels are normal blood vessels or whether there was abnormal new blood vessels and how it is responding to treatment. Uh, those are the things that you can actually see on OCT angiography. Okay, uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, there is another question from the Topkin again. What is your recommendation uh, for the uh, uh, intravitreal anti-VGF based on the amount of macular thickness and visual acuity. Okay, so the amount of macular we don't go we don't go um, doing intravitreal injection just just on the basis of macular thickness uh, and visual acuity. So macular thickness could be macular could be thick because of the you know overall changes in the um, structure of the intraretinal structure and then but if there are no active leakage uh, which we know by uh, any collection of subretinal or sub RPE fluid if there's no active leakage we don't treat uh, macular if only the thick thickened macula because uh, it doesn't uh, quite make sense and if the visual visual acuity is down and if the patient has macular thickness is increased uh, we, we first need to know why the macular thickness is increased. If it is likely that it could be due to the corridor neovascular membrane, there are fluids in the retina underneath the RP, in, intraretinal, subretinal. Uh, in those cases, we just treat with the uh, uh, intravitreal injections, even if the vision is not that bad, like if, even if the vision is 6'9, but there are significant fluid in the macula, we treat it. However, in, if the macula is just thick, there is only degenerative fluid, which has been there for quite a while, vision is not improving with injections, then it's better to not treat those treatment, treat those cases and just, uh, and just um, follow them, um, follow them uh, in, uh, with OCT. Uh, many of the questions. So, if anybody, uh, you can unmute yourself and uh, proceed with the question.
All right, I guess uh, we have answered the many of the question, ma'am. So, okay. so I think so we're we'll be waiting for uh, ma'am. I guess we have almost done it. So still we are waiting for a few minutes. There might be some question. All right, I guess, okay. I guess we have answered many of the queries and considering the time limits here, I announced the closure of the discussion session. So before ending the session, I'd like to uh, express my sincere gratitude towards the doctor, Samikta ma'am and all the attendees and also I'd like to appreciate all the helping hands for iTalks program. Ma'am, before ending the session, if you have any good notes for the platform, yeah, um, it just, it certainly was a very, um, uh, it was a pleasure for me to be with you all this afternoon. And it was very nice talking to you about this, uh, you know, these techniques and all that, which I think all of you know about it, but it's just that sometimes it uh, it helps with your knowledge when you get some sort of, you know, rep you, you get refreshed every now and then. Uh, and I hope, I hope I was able to help you uh, with in doing that and refreshing you. Uh, on the knowledge of your OCT, and I, uh, it was a pleasure for me, and I, I, I hope to be of uh, any help to you guys if you need me in the future as well. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much, ma'am. It's our pleasure, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good day, ma'am. You too. Thank you. Thank you so much everyone. Here we in the today session. Thank you so much.